Houston Station, this is Houston. Are you ready for the event? Houston Station, we are ready for the event. NPR, this is Mission Control Houston. Please call Station for a voice check. Station, this is Joshua Johnson with NPR's 1A broadcast. How do you hear me? Hello, Joshua. We hear you loud and clear. Welcome to the uh, International Space Station. Thank you, Scott and Norishige. It's so great to have some time with you. And I wonder, by way of starting our conversation, first of all, congratulations on your first space flight. I know you have trained for years for this. I wonder what surprised you the most about living aboard the International Space Station. Was there anything that even your training did not fully prepare you for? Scott, why don't we start with you? Uh, you know, the training was long and uh, and it was intense. It was uh, in very much in detail. Uh, there have not been uh, any surprises here. Uh, but uh, one thing that, uh, that I have been wowed by is uh, just the immense beauty of being up here, being in a, a quiet environment with uh, lots of work to do and a great view. Norishige, what about you? Anything about being in space that surprised you or that was different than what you expected? Operationally, nothing is surprising to me. Everything is all being trained and uh, I was capable to do anything about the operation on board the space station. But uh, living in space is a little bit different. We cannot simulate the microgravity and uh, it took a little bit time to adjust myself in this special unique environment. Well, that kind of leads me to my next question, understanding that it is very regimented. I imagine that you two obviously work well in that kind of environment. I bet there are plenty of people who wouldn't. Would you describe for people who don't have the benefit of going to space, what kind of person it takes to spend as much time as you spend on the International Space Station? What are the qualities of a good astronaut, and what are some of the qualities that would disqualify someone from doing what you're doing? Scott? Well, first, you have to be uh, physically fit. It's uh, it's very physically demanding to do all the uh, jobs around here, especially uh, uh, spacewalking. It, uh, it it takes an awful lot uh, physically. Uh, but the other the other side of it too is is you know you got to be good with people. You got to be good with systems. You got to be good with science, technology, engineering, and math. You got to have good patience. You got to be able to work your way through complex problems where there may be three or four or five different answers and uh, be able to invite, include, and inspire those around you to uh, to take a team approach to get to a team conclusion and meet the objective. Norishige, talk about how you reach those kind of team conclusions. I imagine that being part of an international team, that being able to collaborate across cultures is more important than ever. How do you make that work? What does it take? Well, uh, first of all, I have uh, good crewmates, the Scott, and we have uh, Russian commander Anton, and uh, they are very nice people and uh, very easy to work with. And the same on the ground, uh, the flight controllers in Houston, Europe, in Japan, Moscow, they are very intelligent and also very uh, nice to work with. So in that environment, I, I've been trained for years in that environment, uh, and naturally I acquire same kind of uh, nature as an uh, astronaut. So to me, it's very natural. Scott, where are you right now? What part of the Earth are you orbiting over? What can you see? You know, Joshua, I didn't look uh, before we uh, we got here, uh, but we go, we do 16 orbits uh, every day, and uh, pretty much we can see anything from, depending on where the orbit is, from Hawaii to the West Coast, and then sometimes across the uh, United States. We typically see uh, South America, and then over into Europe, and uh, down across uh, Africa, and in uh, the Middle East. And uh, I tell you what, you, you you see it, you know, four or five times a day. It's just amazing. Scott, do you have a favorite vista from space? Is there any part of the Earth that just arrests you every time you float by it? You know, I like North America. Uh, I've traveled the, most of the roads coast to coast, you know, 10 or 15 times in my lifetime. I've uh, visited lots of the uh, parks, Yosemite, Yellowstone, uh, Sequoia, uh, you know, Miles Standish on the East Coast. And, and I'll tell you, it's just a beautiful country. I, I love seeing the roads. I love seeing the towns. And I love thinking about the history when, uh, when I see the country and how it's developed. Let me, ask, let me ask you about some of the work that you're doing on the space station. Norishige, describe for us a typical, if there is such a thing, a typical day of work for you. I understand that your work days are about 12 hours each. Is that right? Yes, that sounds about right. Uh, we are working 
actually waking up on six in the morning and starting work about seven. And we are typically working on the science and also uh, maintenance on the space station. Also, we need uh, every day two and a half hours workout to keep our bone and uh, muscle healthy. And uh, we're going to finish our work around uh, 7 p.m. Uh, with the tag up with the uh, ground control team. So 12, about 12 hours work day sounds right to me. And Norishige, what do you do when you're off work in your downtime? I mean, do you get the weekends off or are you basically working seven days? We have uh, week weekends off. So two days weekend, uh, I usually do uh, uh, cleaning and also uh, watching, uh, observing Earth. Just watching is wonderful and, and amazing experience. And sometimes taking pictures of the Earth, that's also uh, fun. Scott, this is a serious question, but do you guys get Netflix up there? And I only ask because I imagine that being in space is phenomenal, but after a while, you must really want to connect back with what's going on on the Earth, the latest movies and popular culture and current events. Do you ever, do you have access to that up in space or are you completely disconnected from Earth for your time on the station? No, so we don't have uh, live connection with uh, Netflix or, or Amazon Video or anything like that. Uh, but what we do do is uh, we can request a movie and they'll uplink it. And so when we have a few moments and the crew wants to get together, we can set up a projector and watch a movie. Uh, we also have other ways that, you know, they'll send us up, uplink to us uh, news, but it's typically from a day, two days before uh, when you get it. So nothing we really gets live unless we're getting it verbally or via email. Um, on the on the day of, but uh, it's not a bad uh, bad situa situation. Uh, there's lots of movies up here in the data bank, and that we can pull up if uh, you know if we have the spare time. I'm not a big TV watcher or movie watcher, so I don't spend a lot of time doing that up here. It's uh, uh, looking out the window and taking pictures and enjoying the uh, the ISS and all its uh, its its marvelous systems up here is uh, is really what I want to do uh, for the six months that I'm here. And you're pretty pro you're probably just as well getting the news on a day's delay. There's nothing going on done here. We got lots of questions from some of our listeners, particularly about the work that you're doing. El Eileen in Anderson, Indiana, wanted to know if you've discovered something or are working on something that will benefit us here on Earth. Norishige, what do you say? Uh, well, since I'm a medical doctor, I'm interested in the, the medical aspect of the experiment. We are collecting uh, the, the blood, saliva, urine, and uh, examining uh, this material on the ground and uh, also I am uh, participated in uh, some kind of uh, some medical experiment uh, for example the European airway monitoring uh, experiment uh, that is examining uh, the the contents of uh, uh, the breath of the astronaut and uh, by examining that breath we can measure the uh, information inside the lung that kind of exp experiment leads to the uh, easier or earlier diag diagnosis of the pulmon pulmonary disease on the ground. So it's very beneficial for the, not only for the astronaut, but also the, the people on the Earth. You're also both experimenting with growing vegetables in space. Toast Coaster tweeted, what would you most like to grow on the space station? Scott? I think I'd like to grow watermelon. They're just so much, so full of water and refreshing. It'd be great to have uh, fresh watermelon up here. I heard something about Anheuser Busch working with the space station on experimenting with growing barley in space. Scott, I is that so? And I, I assume with there the are certain things grow, you cannot right? do with the barley you grow, right? <laughs> I have not uh, seen any uh, barley here yet. Uh, it may be coming in the, uh, in the future. But, uh, you know, I'm sure everybody's gears are turning now on that one. Victor wanted to know what you do when space junk approaches the space station. Norishige, what's done with space junk? And how much of it do you encounter? Yes, uh, we have a special protecting uh, uh, shield on the space station. So the small debris are not a problem for us. And uh, it's basically uh, protected by the shield. And uh, if we have a big uh, space junk approaching to the ISS, we have a capability to avoid that junk uh, using a thruster on the 
uh, Russian vehicle or thrusters engines on the ISS so we can avoid that uh, space junk. Let me ask you also, Norishige, about the effects of being in space on the body. I've, I've heard in a variety of ways that being in space can take a real toll on the body in some ways, and it changes the function, the physiology, even your height because your spinal cord decompresses. What are some of the effects that you are feeling or noticing there? Yes, uh, generally uh, after the insertion to the orbit, uh, we feel a uh, space motion sickness. And because of the uh, microgravity, our sensation of the up, down, is confused and uh, we got sick and uh, sometimes uh, uh, vomit. But uh, fortunately, I did not have experienced such uh, space motion sickness. And the other one is uh, 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 fluid shift. The basically, the, the body, blood, and the other body fluid are coming upward to the face and the upper part of the body. That makes uh, us a uh, headache or a nausea or um, puffiness of the face. And uh, as you may see, my face is a little bit puffier than uh, usual. Yeah, I, I just looking at you on NASA TV, I can kind of see you know the roundness of your face compared to your bio picture that's on that's on the web. Scott, I kind of wonder as it relates to that, how do you prepare? for that? I mean, that must be one of those aspects of life on a space station that they can tell you about, but th there's not really a way to simulate that on Earth, is there? I mean, you don't really know what that'll feel like until you get there, right? That, that's pretty true. Uh, uh, in uh, Baikonur, uh, they have a couple of uh, machines that we, the tables that we strap to, and they hang us upside down for a little while, and then we spin around in a chair, and, you know, we put our body through some, we make ourselves feel pretty sick. Um, but you know, it, it helps a, a little bit, at least I think it helps, um, but you're right, you never really know for sure until you get here, and you don't get the full effect until you get here, so there's really no way to, uh, to simulate it uh, perfectly. Um, but, you know, it's just a process, and uh, we've had uh, hundreds of people uh, endure that process and do well. And so we, uh, we understand it pretty well, and, uh, and we all expect that uh, people will go through it. There'll be some uncomfort, but uh, it'll go away. Yeah, I'm not sure if that's training or if that's hazing. You may want to ask some questions later on, but at least it seems to be working. You guys seem to be doing pretty well. Let me go back to the, the projects that you're doing regarding plants in zero gravity. What have you learned about the way that plants grow in space? Anything that advances our knowledge of botany or that might be applicable on Earth? Well, first of all, we, we, we can grow the plants on orbit. This is very artificial environment. Uh, of course, it's not uh, sufficient to feed astronauts, but uh, we actually grow the lettuce and uh, ate it, and it was very delicious. And uh, maybe using this technology, we can uh, make uh, uh, plants in the very, uh, for example, the desert, or not suitable for the agriculture, but we can still make uh, food by using this technology. I have to ask you about walking in space. Both of you, as I understand it, had spacewalks earlier this year. Scott, what was that like, the very first time that you actually stepped out into open space? Arduous, as I understand it, very physical, but what went through your head? What went through your heart the very first time you floated in space? Well, the, the first thing that uh, that was, was in my head when the, when the hatch opened is a fresh all the fresh rays, rays of light came right into the airlock, and it had been the first time that I had seen fresh light, you know, not looking through a window, but just right there. And so that, that was when my brain clicked and said, wow, we're, we're going outside, and it, it's going to be, be really cool. Um, when I got outside, uh, by that time I had the switch thrown in my head and it was all about taking care of business. I went out and uh, um, just started feeling what the, uh, what the responses were like on how I have to move my body and get used to the environment. Because we train in a, in a pool where we have neutral buoyancy, but you still have a lot of drag with the water. So it's a, it's a little bit different when you go outside here in space without the, without the water. But um, 
uh, it was an amazing experience. And when we had a few minutes to uh, to relax, look down and see the earth, it's uh, absolutely mind-boggling to be that close to to seeing such a big picture of nature um, and earth and our atmosphere and how thin it is. I know we're low on time, but another question from Sarah in Gilbertsville, Pennsylvania. She wanted to know, Norishige, maybe you can answer this one. Sarah wants to know, how do you maintain relationships with family and friends on Earth when you're away for so long, for your six months on the space station? Yes, we, we can send and receive email. And uh, every weekend we have a family conference. It's a basically a video conference, so I can, I can see uh, my family and friends, I can listen uh, from the news in Japan, from them, and it's very uh, fun time. I wonder, Scott, if I could ask you about the future of the International Space Station. There's been some talk of the Trump administration privatizing the International Space Station. I believe it's funded through 2024. What do you see as the future of international participation in space? Oh, well, as far as the space station goes, I'm sure it's going to continue for for a long time uh, once they uh, identify some partners that might want to help keep it running and keep it going. It's just so valuable. We have such a great uh, national laboratory up here, lots of uh, resources to do testing in an environment like nothing we could ever achieve on Earth. Uh, it's uh, it's very unique and very valuable, and we need it to do all of the research and, and some of the development that we need to get back to the moon and then, and then on to Mars. So it's valuable. Um, international partnership, I see it being stronger than ever in the future. Uh, we're we're going to go back to the moon and we're going to head into uh, deep space locations uh, and we're going to need an international partnership to do it. So I think what you're seeing here as far as an international partnership goes on this uh, space station is just the tip of the iceberg when it comes to uh, uh, the rest of the world working together to, to get humans into deep space. And before we let you go, Norishige, I hope you two know how important the work is that you're both doing. And I know that you two know how crazy things are on Earth right now. Does it ever feel like a relief, at the very least an honor for sure, but maybe a relief to have a chance to be up in space while the rest of us deal with the troubles of the world? Yes, uh, actually, because of the communication is very uh, developed and uh, always we can uh, communicate with friends and the flight controllers on the ground. So I, I do not feel uh, detached from the earth. So I, to me, it's, it's very natural. It's isolated, but still I'm connected to the ground. So no problem for me. And Scott, briefly, same question before we let you go. Yeah, same for me. I, you know, I, I still feel like I'm part of it. Uh, my news might be a day or two late, but uh, keeping up with what's going on and talking to my relatives, I got a lot of email going back and forth. I, I feel as much a part of uh, of uh, life on Earth as I do uh, do in space. I just happen to be representing from space at this moment in time. So uh, it's an honor and it's a privilege, and uh, and it'll be good to to bring all this experience back home and and uh, give it to back to the uh, American people. Well, the honor and the privilege was ours for being able to speak with you. Scott Tingle and Norishige Kanai. Gentlemen, best to you in space. Stay safe, work hard, and thank you both for talking to us. Thank you, Joshua. Have a great day. Station, this is Houston ACR. That concludes the event. Thank you, all participants with NPR Station. We are now resuming operational audio communications.